Before you go any further, if you haven't read the guide notes, pause the video, go back, read the guide notes, write questions in the margin, annotate, don't worry, we'll wait for you. Cool. Excellent, right. This is lesson three, forensic psychology, the one no doubt you've all been waiting for, biological explanations of criminal behavior. Are criminals just born that way? Could we uh, save ourselves a lot of heartache by weeding them out, the genetic population, eugenic style? Or is a lot of this just correlation without causation? Hopefully these questions will be answered during this session. This is actually part one of a two part um, video series because if you look at the specification, it is huge. You need to know the historic approach uh, to explaining criminality from a biological perspective as well as more modern explanations involving genetics, neuroanatomy and neurochemistry. So it all begins with Cesar Lombroso. This quote from Caesar really um, encapsulates his view on what he believes are the particular characteristics of criminals. Pause it, have a read. Good, so this is Lombroso. Um, he pioneers the theory of the atavistic form. So atavistic means genetic throwback, uh, sort of unevolved. Um, creature would be atavistic and he argues that criminals are essentially less evolved than the rest of us he was the founder of criminology and many of the principles he established and some of the methods he did really uh, created a baseline foundation for what we now refer to as offender profiling which you've looked at in two forms he made criminology more scientific uh, by carrying out lots of observations and developed, as we said, his theory of atavistic form. So what is atavistic form? Well, these are characteristics that indicate uh, less evolved um, heritage, let's say. So they are markers, mainly features to do with the face and the skull. Um, some examples are a narrowing or sloping of the brow. You might have a prominent jaw coming out, jutting out, high cheekbones. Uh, facial asymmetry. So uh, I think we talked about before the idea that facial symmetry is actually seen to be very attractive. And attractive people are more trustworthy. So we could see where Lombroso is getting his idea about facial asymmetry. But the idea it really is that one side of your face is significantly different to the other. They're not symmetrical. He went even further than just a more general category and actually identified particular characteristics that he thought belonged to criminals uh, of a particular type. So murderers have these bloodshot eyes and curly hair and, and long, long ears. Um, Sexual deviants have glinting eyes and fleshy, pouty lips and projecting ears for some reason. And fraudsters are thin and willowy, um, uh, what he refers to as reedy, which I quite like as a, a term that I'm going to try and use now. He was reedy. Um, so the atavistic form, let's have a look. Here's some uh, mug shots of the time. Let's look for some asymmetry. We can see it here. This guy's uh, right side of his face is fairly uh, normal and uniform, but on the left side, it, it sort of bulges out here. More evidence, possibly of asymmetry. Asymmetry again, uh, possible asymmetry. The lighting's not great. A sloping brow is a bit difficult to uh, see. We've got some uh, sticky out here's down here, so perhaps some sexual deviancy. Um, some longer ears, maybe a yeah, long ears, maybe a murderer. This is the sort of thing that, that Cesar Lombroso is really talking about. Analyzing features like this. Now he didn't just invent these ideas, he actually examined over 383 skulls of deceased criminals and 3,839 skulls of living criminals. So he had a huge sample that he used and he was essentially adopting a nomothetic approach by 
carrying out all this carefully um, carefully observed research involving precise measurements and things like that um, in order to draw general conclusions about the characteristics of criminals. He concluded from his research that 40% of criminal acts were linked to this atavistic style. So that's Lombroso's theory. He didn't entirely reject environment. It's obviously on the uh, nature side of the nature-nurture debate. He didn't in exclusively reject the environment. He said that uh, possessing the atavistic traits, in many ways you also need an environmental trigger. He also wasn't wholly determinist in the sense that he also recognised that not everyone who had these atavistic traits became criminals. So there is a small element of, of uh, perhaps soft determinism rather than really hard determinism. But you could argue uh, to some extent both ways. So his main contribution is as the father of criminology. And this first evaluation point I've written out in a PEE format and I've compounded it. So the point is Lombroso is, is hailed as the father of uh, criminology, contributed to the field with his nomothetic, so I've chucked that in there to demonstrate that I know what I'm talking about. He attempted to draw general conclusions about criminal tendencies from specific observations. What would work there is something a bit more concrete, such as, for example, particular features such as prominent ears or jaw. By doing so, he actually moved criminology away from the moralistic and religious uh, field of just evil or whatever it may have been to more scientific um, explanation based on evolution. One of the uh, strongest elements of his, his, of his approach is his theory is developed based on observations. And if it's a theory uh, that is testable, then it can be falsified. So its strength is that he's developing these theories that can actually be falsified. And this is why the compound works quite well here, is because actually Lombroso did not involve in his study a control group. So he looked at criminals' uh, skulls, dead and alive, but he never looked extensively at non-criminals. Therefore, he's got nothing to compare it with. As a result, his biggest strength is that his ability to falsify his predictions, really, is also his biggest weakness because Gorin comes along and does exactly that. He tests atavistic form on 3,000 criminals, 3,000 non-criminals. He finds no differences between the two. So, it's a good, good use of compound evaluation there. Some other evaluations then are... Uh, Delisi suggests Lombroso's work has racial undertones. Um, he's talking about curly hair, prominent lips. I mean, there is a stereotype here that it feels like you might be playing to. And it's arguable that certain classes, certain races may actually be more overrepresented in the atavistic form. So there, there are maybe some racial undertones there. That's not the strongest criticism of the validity of the um, approach, though. So just remember, that might be a good one to throw in a bit later. It, uh, in some ways, a worse one is it lends quite a lot of support to eugenics philosophies. If you can establish that a criminal has certain features, you can just find everyone with those features and lock them up, surely. Or at least stop them from breeding. And then over time, you will have removed the criminal element from society. This is problematic. I would read more widely on eugenics. It applies to a number of different fields. Right, genetic determinism. Uh, you could argue hard, probably more like soft determinism, but still this if you've got the wrong, you know, you've got the atavistic form and you happen to be in a bad environment, bad luck, buddy, you're a criminal. Gender bias, androcentrism. So most of his observations were on male criminals. And in fact, he, like Freud, he treated women as an afterthought. He also f thought that women already were less evolved. So you could argue that 
His research suffers from a beta bias in that he didn't consider women, but also an alpha bias because he believed women were inferior. Um, more appropriately, perhaps, is androcentrism in that he was um, mainly seeing the world through the lens of a sort of male. However, it is worth noting that the majority of criminals are men, and therefore, to some extent, an alpha bias may be uh, justified or androcentrism can be partially justified, uh, perhaps. I'm not, I'm not 100% on that, actually. Causation versus correlation. Uh, cranial and facial anomalies. If you grow up poor, you may develop less uh, symmetrically as a result of just growing up in a hostile environment. You may suffer wounds and things like that as a result of just growing up being poor so it's not necessarily that you have these features therefore you're a criminal these features may come from the sort of environment you grow up in which may also involve crime uh, some evidence that low intelligence is linked to crime and i'll put this in the description of the video but there is some evidence that low iq is linked now that sort of lends some support that at least the genetic basis upon which sort of lombroso's work resides has some validity but of course um, this is second hand potentially now this is the most valuable part uh, in some ways everything we talk about here can be used in a approaches essay on biology biological approach and equally much of the many of the criticisms that we we uh, evaluated the biological approach with can be applied here this is so synoptic, this course, that you can use anything, anywhere, if you can justify it. So, that's Lombroso and his atavistic style. We're going to look at another theory that focuses primarily on body. And it essentially forms the same idea. But uh, Kretschmer is this uh, researcher who develops uh, somatotypes. Now, we still use these somatotypes today, but not for a criminal profiling, interestingly. Uh, so he argued that criminals tend to have a particular uh, phenotype. In this case, it was uh, one of three specific types. He has to come up with four in total, but they correspond to the three recognized later. So you have the leptosome or athletic type thin tall and, and people tended to be petty thieves who, who met this description the athletic tall and muscular um crimes of violence kind of makes sense uh pikenik short and fat commit crimes of deception and sometimes violence and dysplastic or mixed and that's more than one type uh, crimes against morality, e.g. prostitution. So, from Ernst's point of view, he's looking at it as a particular body type might make you more uh, prone to a particular crime. Now, there is some innate logic here. If you're going to be a thug, it probably helps to have a muscular tone that can deal with thuggery. If you're going to be a thief, maybe you get into petty thievery because you're not particularly muscular. Yeah, muscular and as a result that's the type of crime that you can engage in so there's a small amount of sort of innate logic uh, that we could apply to it well uh, the one of the limitations is the actual evidence that uh, Kretschmer provided has never actually been provided I mean he as far as we know kept notebooks but these were never published or, or produced so we can never really verify his evidence Having said that, uh, Gluick and Gluick in, in the 70s found that 60% of delinquents were these mesomorph types. Now, mesomorph is uh, muscular, well-built. Um, and we kind of talked briefly before about the logic of that. Uh, Sheldon created his own classification, and that's those are the three that you see in the... Uh, drawing and these were ectomorphs mesomorphs and endomorphs he found in a study of 200 uh, young adults the delinquents were more likely to be mesomorphs and once more uh, that's probably because young delinquents 
who are particularly muscular may be uh, uh, more effective as a delinquent. This research suggests perhaps an innate link between body type and criminality, though the link is uh, correlational and not necessarily causal. Uh, could be causal. Some of the research methods then we've talked about, we're coming to the end soon. Control, Lombroso didn't have it, and it's really important to have a, a baseline to compare your, um, your experimental condition with. Uh, experimental design, in this case, lots of observations, but with very precise measurements. So he would you know, measure elements of the skull and things like that. Bias, possibly gender bias, possibly confirmation bias and such and correlation versus causation. What a reading, uh, The Anatomy of Violence. Uh, I do have a copy which I may uh, bring in, uh, but I probably want another read of it myself actually, because it's been a while. Uh, the Biological Roots of Crime looks at the genetics, uh, neuroanatomy and so forth uh, involved. Also, read up on the eugenics movement. It will give you a basis of some of the fear um, that is generated by any sort of discussion about the biology of crime or indeed the biology of almost any human behaviour. And uh, phrenology. There is a, uh, a skull it's on my desk outlining uh, the basics of um, personality, uh, drawn all over the skull come and have a look at it but it's worth having a quick uh, recap of phrenology we have talked about it before um, but it's probably worth your time having a quick reread because many of the ideas translate and transfer so that's us more or less done i just want to whiz through a very basic essay structure i've tried to structure the the lecture in in a sort of 16 mark style this would be my sort of idea for an essay plan, it would be Lombroso, paragraph one, and the atavistic form. Paragraph two, maybe an evaluation point, compound evaluation point, the one we used. Uh, Kretschmer's somatotypes, A01, paragraph uh, four. So it's sort of going A01, evaluation, A01, evaluation. And that works as well as A01, A01, evaluation, and so forth. And then something like this. I would always recommend though, if I've got four evaluation points, I would always recommend finishing off with a little compound evaluation involving determinism and reductionism or something like that. Because that's a nice way. Your early evaluations just for good reading should be sort of very specific. And then moving out to the more general criticism of the field, of the approach and so forth. Well, that is um, biological explanations of offending behaviour, a historical approach, including the atavistic form. As always, if you have any questions about the video, please email me. There's a short 10-question uh, checklist uh, underneath that I would like you to complete. And really important, the how confident do you feel? That gives me a snapshot straight away with what I need to focus on uh, in lesson. Again, thank you very much for your time and I look forward to seeing you uh, soon.